Okay, I think we are about to get started this evening with our Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. Our 2020 inaugural SPF Global Virtual Conference. So we're just going to use a few moments of this welcome chatter in order to welcome everyone here. I know we're going to take a few minutes just to make sure that everybody is on screen. I think I do hear some kickback somewhere. I think it may be, you know, our internet connection. And if that's the case for you listening to us, we're very sorry for the technology that sometimes is wonderful and sometimes it works great. So I'm not really sure how many people are actually on right now. I really can't see that screen. I know that some of you folks are raising your hand and wanting to answer some questions. I wanted to tell you about the questions this evening. There is a uh, shared uh, chat Q&A at the bottom. And if you will, uh, put your questions in that Q&A portion that is on Zoom. And if you have questions that you would like for the doctors to add, answer at a later Zoom, then please email those to the spastic conference at gmail.com. And we are putting those together so that we can have them on a future Zoom. And we may even invite the the person that asked those questions to be on the screen with that particular doctor. So again, I'd like to welcome you. We are going to be starting this uh, conference in just a few moments. Uh, and I'm just kind of giving a little bit of this welcome chatter time so that you can uh, get a chance to get on. I know there's a number of folks I think at this point that there's about 70 people that have got on and there's about 200 that have registered. So there are some people that are raising their hands, so I must apologize. Let me stop sharing screen so that we can see if there are some additional questions that are being asked in this. Okay, so there's no questions in the, in the question chat box. We are not going to be taking uh, questions from people on the screen. I think there is some, uh, I don't know what I need to do to fix that. So hold on just a moment and let me see if I can work on this for just a second. That's what this uh, chat was supposed to be for. So hold on just a minute. Okay, so I'm hopeful that that perhaps maybe fix that. Um, so I do apologize again that there seemed to be some major echo, major echoing going on. So that's what this first few minutes was supposed to be, is to give us a chance to allow all of our um, technical work to be fixed. So again, uh, we definitely want to apologize for that. We're not trying to prove that we're experts in this Zoom technology, we are trying to get the information to you. So let me go back now. I think that might be maybe a little better, maybe not 100% better, but it is a little better. So we wanted to make sure uh, to get that taken care of for you. So let's go back to sharing screen and then we'll go on and do what we've got to do to get ready for the rest of the evening. 
So a little bit of tidbits that we wanted to talk about. Hopefully you guys can see this screen going on now. Uh, we do have about 80 something people on right now. So that's so good. Thank you very much for joining us. And again, sorry for the technical issues that we were having. But I wanted to tell you and to share with you, I never really get a chance to talk with you about the Spastic Paraplegia Conference. Uh, we um, are very saddened that we were not able to have the in-person conference this year. And that, therefore the Zoom program has been, I think the best platform for us to consider. Uh, we may consider doing some type of a virtual live feed in the future, and we may, you know, try to see what we can do uh, about having that available. Even if we do have an in-person conference, then we may still have um, some type of technology where we're broadcasting it uh, to everyone across the world. So, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, there is a Q&A box. Uh, most of them are at the bottom of people's screens. I don't know where yours may be. Uh, mine right now is on the top of the screen. So I would like to invite you to ask a question related to your disease, uh, related to HSP and PLS, and we will capture those questions uh, for our doctors to talk with and answer and discuss probably on a future Zoom. Uh, it's very unlikely that we will answer those questions this evening. However, there are some of you that did send in to the spastic conference at Gmail uh, email address. We asked you if you had questions to make sure that you um, send those to us. So if the doctors does have, if they do have time at the end of their program, then they will um, try to get those questions in. Uh, but if you, um, if they do not have time to do those, then we will please take those by email. And I would like to see that we do a future Zoom with those doctors, with all of our doctors, and perhaps maybe even um, invite you to ask that question online uh, with that doctor. So if that's the case, then please, you know, feel free to email those to us at spasticconference at gmail.com or you can, um, you know, ask them on the Zoom platform that you have here in front of you. Either way, we'll get those, we'll put those into a list and we'll go from there. So hopefully that's enough about that. I wanted to share with you tonight uh, that we have finally found a, um, a online store that can work with us. As you guys know, when you start doing online stores that it is a little cumbersome. Uh, we have set this up so that it would be available for um, basically uh, months to month. Uh, the way most of these online programs want to work is that um, we will do what we call a campaign. So we will put together, uh, these shirts are available right now to order. When you go to place your order, you will uh, see that it says that there's so many days within this particular month or campaign that once all of that, uh, all of those have been ordered during this particular time frame, then they will um, stop the uh, allowing of that particular order, that campaign, and they will then print all of those shirts, ship all of those shirts directly to you, whatever it is that you have ordered. And then come July 1 through July 30th, we will have another order that will be um, put together. Uh, so once everybody has kind of decided that they don't really want these particular uh, styles of shirts anymore, then we'll move on to some other type product. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to watch is that if the, we order all of these products and then they're not sold, then we have to sit on those products and wait till people want them. And so in this particular way, we are able to work with this company, our, our partner, and you guys can order these directly yourself. So we're gonna see which one of the products that people tend to want. So we kind of got a heathered blue color, if you will and the red color and these are the logos that we have uh, that we've got for our foundation and we will then uh, see what we need to do to add more products they can also be shipped uh, internationally and uh, there is a, um, a, a way that 
our printer will do those for us. So please feel free to, you know, link with, as you see at the very top of the page, uh, sp-foundation.org uh, slash SPF dash store. And that will get you to this page basically, and then goes to our partnering page. So I wanted to share that with you this evening so that you have a chance to um, be able to bring awareness and help folks to understand what our disease uh, diseases are and you know feel proud to sport these shirts and be able to share with people and help them to understand um, you know what we've got, what we're dealing with. So I will move on. Uh, the next thing I wanted to share with you, uh, we're, we're hopeful. I have uh, basically all of the doctors that we have shared at our annual conference. For those of you that do not know me and have not met me, uh, my name is Norma Pruitt and I am the conference uh, coordinator uh, for the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation as well as the co-executive director uh, working to raise awareness and raise funds for the foundation. And so, um, it just naturally kind of fell into my lap to be the virtual conference coordinator, which quite honestly, I think it's much easier to coordinate this conference in person, uh, even though there may be a lot of little ends to take care of. Uh, you're not so, you know, dependent upon necessarily the technology and we like the camaraderie of being able to visit with, uh, you know, friends that we've met over the years. And we're, you know, hopeful that we will be able to get back to, um, dealing with an in-person in conference, you know, maybe in the future. So uh, what we're going to do uh, is this tonight was our guinea pig and we love Dr. Corey and Dr. Fink and we are going to, uh, you know, host them, uh, Dr. Corey tonight and Dr. Fink uh, tomorrow night or tomorrow at lunchtime. But in between now and August the 23rd, I am hopeful, and you guys, uh, with your overwhelming positive affirmations uh, that you like what we're doing tonight and tomorrow, and if we have a bunch of negative stuff, we probably, you know, will rethink our process, uh, but I am hopeful, seriously, between uh, this weekend and August the 23rd that we will have a platform available for all of our fine doctors. Uh, I have had communications with all of them that have presented with us in the past, and they are very happy to come and present information to you and talk with you about the various things that they have been working on this last year. And my goodness, they are truly working hard to try to find a cure, find treatments for HSP and PLS. And, you know, we need to do all we can to love up on them and, and appreciate them for all of their hard work because it is really hard work. And so, but between now and then, uh, you guys just, you know, kind of reach out, pay attention to what's going on on our social media platforms and, and uh, you know, communicate however you want to, you know, email me at spasticconference at gmail.com. But come the week of August the 23rd through August the 29th, which is the board designated awareness week. And I know some of you guys got in last year on announcing the various things that you did. You know, we certainly want you to make sure that you um, tag our HSP and PLS, you know, and when you're talking to people, you can easily just say, go to Google, type in hashtag HSP PLS, you'll find out everything you need to find out about what kind of disease that I am uh, having to deal with. And, you know, please donate to our foundation. So it will be an easy way to tell people, you know, what we're dealing with. Uh, but come August the 23rd through the 29th, we've created these challenges. And what we want you to do, obviously, is to shout out these things with the hashtag each and every day of the week. And if you're going to be doing a 5K, and I think Jim Sheehan is working on a 5K, uh, virtual 5K uh, for some time during this time frame as well. But we're going to pick each of these days and at 12 o'clock noon, we're gonna, for about 30 minutes, anybody that wants to get on and visit with us, we're gonna have this whole entire screen filled with all of the little thumbnails that anybody that wants to get on so that we can uh, show 
the challenge that you're doing that day or the photos or videos or anything that you want to share with us on each and every one of those days during this particular week. So with that being said, if you have uh, something else that you would like for us to add to this list, we'd be glad to listen to that and try to put that in as well while we are trying to do all the things that we can to bring awareness to the challenge and help folks to perhaps maybe reach out and reach in and find ways to donate to the foundation so that we can use that money for medical research. So now with that being said, that's kind of what I wanted to tell you guys about. I wanted to introduce myself to you and give time for our technology to kind of catch up. Thank you for all of the people that are online with us tonight. Remember, send your questions to uh, our spastic conference uh, at gmail.com. And then uh, if there are any other particular questions that you um, have for us, then we will answer those questions uh, as we uh, uh, have those available. Uh, one last thing I wanted to share with you here is uh, what we are anticipating as our agenda for those of you that have um, uh, Facebook, social media, you know, LinkedIn, all those platforms, we have all those available for our foundation. So uh, we're going to be tonight talking with Dr. Corey at seven. Uh, and then tomorrow we will be coming back on at 11 o'clock. I probably won't chatter as much tomorrow as I am today. And then the rest of the work of the foundation and then Dr. Fink will join us at 12 uh, central time tomorrow evening. So with that being said, one of the things that I'd like to do right now is I would like to introduce to you the uh, president of the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. He has worked very, very hard for the foundation and for a number of years. He started and served with the board of directors in 2005. And then he also then became and was elected president of the foundation in January of, of 2012. And he is Mr. Frank Davis. And I'd like to invite him to join us uh, on, the, on the screen. And then I'm gonna jump off the screen and I'll be in the background. So if you guys have any questions, then please feel free to um, ask me a question and I'll do what I can to answer that. So here we are. Frank, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you have a good evening. Hello everyone. And welcome to the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation 2020 annual conference. That for the first time, as you have, know, is a virtual conference as a, uh, Norman was trying to explain, we, uh, we uh, have really tried to iron out the rough edges. So if there are any rough edges, I hope all of you guys can be uh, patient with us. We're really grateful to all of our sponsors who, uh, for, for this entire conference. And we want to especially thank those uh, major sponsors. And they are Chris Burkini, who most of you know, uh, with Burkini Farms along with News Corporation, who owns a lot of uh, television channels and newspapers. And we're grateful to them for their sponsorship. And the Hanger Foundation that has been sponsoring um, charities like us uh, ever since the mid 1800s. So they have a lot of experience and uh, generosity, which we're very grateful to all you guys because we could not have this conference without you. For the last many years, I have been the person that gets the ball rolling at our at these at these annual conferences with my introductory talk. I don't have any medical training, and so all I can do is introduce people and thank them and try to promote our foundation as best I can. I try to say something about the city where our uh, conference is being held because a lot of people are visiting and want to know what to visit. And I try to tie our conference into uh, something about the city um, as a theme. Uh, we make, uh, five years ago, our conference was, was in Seattle and I tried to tie our conference, the theme of our conference was uh, singing in the rain. And I, I paid for and sent everybody that was in attendance that classic movie singing in the rain before that uh, conference. Four years ago, our conference was in Chicago, and um, I, I made the theme of our conference the music of Chicago, which is, as you know, uh, the blues. And I sang a version of the song by Eric Clapton called the uh, Walking Man's Blues to tie it into our organization and called it the HSP and PLS Walking Man's Blues. 
three years ago, our conference was in Atlanta, and I tried to tie our foundation into the get down to business, get things done uh, attitude that Atlanta has with that same attitude that our, our foundation has. And uh, <clears throat> two years ago, our conference was in Pittsburgh, and um, I tied our foundation to Pittsburgh because our resolve to cure HSP and PLS is as strong as steel. Last year in San Antonio, I could not attend our conference because my father's funeral was on the same day. <clears throat> my father was a remarkable man who lived a very good, healthy, productive life for 95 years, and he was one of our major sponsors. He would have been 96 uh, the next month. I hope you can un understand how I could not miss his funeral. Tim Crogan did an excellent job of managing things in my stead, and so I owe a great deal of uh, thanks to Tim for his efforts. When we first decided this year that it was necessary to cancel our in-person annual conference and turn it into this sort of virtual conference, we were kind of feeling sorry for ourselves. We were all going to greatly miss the opportunity, which is our only opportunity every year, to meet so many of you guys in person. Remember the days when shaking hands with someone was a welcome experience? How things have changed in only the last few months. Anyway, the advantages of this virtual conference is, as you know, you save the cost of travel and hotel. Not to mention you save the risk of uh, catching COVID-19. With this virtual conference, you can attend the speakers you want to attend. And if you don't have time to attend other speakers, you can skip them. We are planning to have over the next several weeks, many more speakers than we ever could have managed at an in-person live conference. And these speakers are eager to help out. We will be, you will be getting many announcements and invitations by email but to, and Facebook and our website to hear many of these world-renowned experts on motor, upper motor neurology, i.e. HSP and PLS, over the next several weeks. I want to start off my introductions today and thank yous by congratulating our conference coordinator this year, that you, who just finished speaking, along with her husband, Greg, Norman Greg Pruitt. They've done an excellent job, as they always do, of organizing and um, coordinating this conference. They did lots of research and trials of the different ways a virtual conference can be held and decided on this Zoom uh, software, um, which we're using today. I know it may seem strange to give virtual applause, but I hope everyone will join me in giving a virtual round of thankful applause to uh, Norman Greg Hackett. I, mean, it. I wonder how many of you actually clapped. Other ways that the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation does things that no one should forget is are the scientists that keep working diligently on, this, for, on these diseases. Many will be speaking over the next few weeks. As I said before, you will be getting invitations to hear them by email over the next few weeks. They are some of the most brilliant minds in the world concerning our rare diseases, and they will tell you about how the hope for a cure and the hope of science is working toward our cures. Our board of directors all have that unforgettable resolve every day trying to manage the work of our foundation. It is really more work than you can imagine. Our state ambassadors are all part of the same unforgettable SPF spirit with their state meetings and fellowship working toward a cure. But you know what? None of this, not a single thing could be possible without those people that make everything we do possible. It is you and other people attending today and all the people in our membership that make the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation the foundation that is able to do what we are going to do, which is cure HSB and PLS. The Spastic Paraplegia Foundation was founded in February of 2002. There are 18,346 different names and addresses in our database. These are people that either have HSP or PLS, or they care enough about someone with HSP or PLS to have made one or more donation in the past 18 years. 
1,616 different people donated to our cause in 2019. They made 3,750 different donations totaling over $890,000. You may ask why, how we could have so many more donations than donors, and that is because a lot of people uh, donate on a monthly basis uh, the same amount every month, and that <clears throat> has proven to be very convenient and easy for a lot of people to, to do. And so any of you that want to try that out, um, please, you're very welcome to do so. Our donations have been growing very helpfully over the last few years, and I want to sincerely thank you guys for making this possible. As you know, our mission is to fund research to cure HSP and PLS. And it is only through your donations that we are able to complete our mission. Thank you all so much. Scientists estimate that there are about 25,000 people with HSP and about 1,000 people with PLS in the United States alone. HSP is often called by different names. It is called strumpel lorraine syndrome, mostly in Europe, after the two doctors in the late 1800s and early 1900s that were studying HSP. It's also called familial spastic paraplegia, hereditary spastic paraplegia, and hereditary spastic paraparesis, but they are really all the same disorder. Unfortunately, we only have a record of three, about 3,013 different people with HSP in the United States in our database. A contrast to that low percentage number is that of the estimated 1,000 people with PLS in the United States, we have a record of almost the whole number, or 934 in our database. So why is it? <clears throat> why is it that, only, that we only have contact information for about 12% of the people with HSP in the United States, and we have contact information for about 93% of the people with PLS in the United States. I have a theory. It's not only scientists who have theories. HSP has been in many families for several generations. In my over 15 years of volunteering uh, for this foundation, I have found that often there is one member of an HSP family, an HSP large extended family, that the family seems to appoint to be responsible for the rest of the members of the family to let them know if there are any developments <coughs> scientifically. And to do that, they just keep in touch with our foundation. That family member is supposed to let the other family members know if any developments occur. A lot of HSP families just think of HSP as their family disease, and they have learned to just accept and live with it. Some aren't really clear what the name of it is, thinking that there is not much anybody can do about it. Well, let me tell you, if you are a member of one of those kinds of HSP families, let me tell you that those are the old days. With current science and genetic research, the HSP world is changing like the entertainment world changed when the television was invented and it replaced the radio. That change means that our HSP families need to similarly change our mindsets. New genetic science companies are popping up monthly, not yearly, but monthly all over the world. Scientists are coming to us and they want to know how many people with this kind of gene uh, we can contact and because they have an idea or how many people of that kind of gene they can contact because they have a new theory. They do not want to try They do not want to try to cure a gene if there aren't enough people with that confirmed gene to work with to make it through clinical trials, which is a critical step. That is why it is so important that we have more information about people with HSP. We need to know how to contact them or you, and if at all possible, what HSP gene they or you have. Speaking of genetic tests, it wasn't long ago that getting an HSP genetic test was very expensive. When I got my test over 15 years ago, it cost me about $10,000. A few years after that, the price climbed to $29,000 to get an HSP genetic test. 
I was so shocked by that price that I even called the company to confirm that price. And they said, yes, that is the price. Well, in the last many years, that price continues to drop every year dramatically. The last time I checked, it cost about $1,200 to get a full HSP genetic test. And I think it has come down a lot since then. You can find contact information for genetic testing companies on our website. One way to make it even more affordable that a lot of HSP families have discovered is that for a lot of people in the extended HSP family to pitch in to let one member of the family with the, with the uh, symptoms to go get a genetic test, then it will cost that, that one member a lot less because the other people are pitching in. And then when that one genetic, that, that one person has the results of their genetic test, then the other members who haven't gotten symptoms yet or want a confirmation of some sort, they can get that one gene tested for about $100 each. And that is a heck of a lot less expensive. Additionally, for those of you that may not be able to afford the $1,200 cost, even with the help of family members, those, um, it, almost all of those companies that are on our website have plans that if you can prove your financial situation, they will uh, do, they will price it to you at a lot less lower cost or for free. <clears throat> for those of you that do know your gene, I think you will agree that there is some relief that you are making progress towards finding, towards getting much closer to the day when you can be cured. The most common HSP gene is the SPG4 or Spastin. About 40% of people with HSP have SPG4. Of the about 10,000 people that have SPG4 HSP in the United States, we have 243 of them in our database. The second most common HSP gene is SPG7 or paraplegian. About 17% of people with HSP have SPG7. Of the probably 4,250 people with SPG7 in the United States, we have 103 of them in our database. The third most common HSP gene is SPG11 or spastic sin. About 8% of people with HSP have SPG11. Of the about 2,000 people that have SPG11 in the United States, we have 54 in our database. I'm, don't worry, I'm not gonna do this all night. <laughs> These numbers continue to drop as we get to the more and more rare and rare, um, rare and rarer types of HSP. I hope you can see how the real effectiveness of our foundation is hindered by not having more participation or more uh, gene information from our data, from the people out there with HSP and how much more effective we could be, especially with the scientific community, if um, more of you could be uh, have your contact information in our records and uh, if we could find out what gene you have. <clears throat> well, a lot has happened in the 18 years since the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation was founded in February of 2002. It was Mark Weber and Kathy Geisler, and I saw her name just on just a minute ago, who founded our, our foundation in February of 2002. It was Mark, uh, I said that, they had the help of Dr. John Fink at the University of Michigan and several other volunteers, and they had the vision of what we have before us today. I think they knew about four genes when we got started with this foundation. Since that time, over 80 genes have been found that when mutated can cause HSP. What do genes do? Genes create proteins. Proteins are the linkages between the proteins and the microtubules that move the proteins and the proteins that sever the microtubules after they've mo moved the proteins and some other proteins that act like the janitors, janitors in the cell to move out dead material. These are all part of the HSP disorder. As I mentioned to you before, the sunlight of new hope is right there on the horizon. Thousands of scientific research articles have been published on HSP and PLS. You can think of those research articles as stepping stones toward, our, toward the cure of these diseases. 
the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation has funded over $9 million of the research on HSP and PLS. As I mentioned before, our foundation has state ambassadors in almost every state of the United States. Those state ambassadors will have get-togethers a few times per year, inviting people with HSP and PLS, along with their family and caregivers, to, to get-togethers. You will see uh, and meet other people in your community with either HSP or PLS. And if you ask me, those people in your community are the real experts on these conditions. At past live annual conferences, I have introduced and thanked all state ambassadors in attendance. I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and strongly thank all of you who volunteer your time to be a state ambassador. Thank you so much, you are a humongous help. Every year I also introduce all of our board of directors to save time today because they are not in the same room with me and I can't ask them each to stand while I talk about them. I will not tell you about each of them. Please know, however, that they are all each very uniquely skilled individuals and we all work together in a very synchronistic, positive, fruitful, and productive way. You can read about each of them on our web website. One of our directors, Dr. Corey Brostad, a world-renowned PhD genetic scientist who is also a volunteer on our scientific advisory board, will be speaking to you in just a few moments. Our medical advisor, Dr. John K. Fink, is also someone that you will be hearing speak tomorrow. Dr. Fink goes above and beyond in his quest to for the cure for both HSP and PLS. Believe it or not, the one person that has never missed a single uh, Spastic Paraplegia Foundation annual conference is our own Dr. John K. Fink. I will now turn things over to one of of our conference coordinators, Greg Pruitt, who has the honor of introducing our speaker for the day, Dr. Corey Brostad, PhD. Good afternoon. It's great to be with all of you again as we uh, talk about the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. And on behalf of our board, uh, we certainly want to say thank you to Frank. Uh, if you've met him before and you know Frank, uh, you know how hard he works, uh, how much HSP is on his mind at all times. And we appreciate so much uh, the leadership that he provides to our organization. I want to talk with you for a few moments this afternoon and perhaps a few more before tomorrow's uh, conference uh, activity about our foundation because every year at this annual conference uh, we meet new people new people learn about the foundation and this foundation one of the things you'll hear me say a number of times and that Frank mentioned it as well everyone who serves on this board Norma and I as co-executive directors and the, the different committee chair all of the all of us serve we are volunteers this foundation, as Frank mentioned, uh, became uh, legal and, and uh, official in 2002 with a lot of work from those who had come before. Since that time, the foundation continues to grow, but it grows because of people who get involved and who make SPF and, and raising money for medical research to find cures and treatments for these rare diseases, one of the priorities of their life. And so we want to thank all of you that have become part of, of this foundation's work over the years and we want to take a few moments because we feel like we have a number of folks who maybe are meeting us for the first time. Every year at the annual conference, we meet people who have just learned within the past year or two that they might have one of these diseases or the symptoms have just reached the point where they've decided to get involved. Uh, that was my experience. Uh, I come from a family uh, over the last three generations, we believe now 12 of us have had HSP. And we are SPG4. 
Uh, my father fought it for 43 years before his death. And so as I began having the symptoms, I knew what it probably was and, and went on the internet, began trying to find information. And that's where I found the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. And I learned that in 2009, they were having an annual convention in St. Louis. And so that was my first uh, attendance at a convention. And when I walked in there and began to see and observe and meet people who were sharing the same problems that my family, my father and I were experiencing, uh, it gave me some people I could talk to and learn from. It also helped me make friendships that exist even today. That as we work through these difficulties, we can talk and learn from each other and support one another. So we appreciate the work of those who came before us and we appreciate uh, Frank's leadership and every board member that we have. A number of the things I wanna talk to you about though, refer back to our website. We hope many of you have been on the website. We hope all of you have. But as Frank mentioned, you can meet all of our board there. Uh, it's good for you to know them. There may be board members who live in your part of the country. Uh, by getting to know them, uh, you can get more involved in the activities of the foundation and again, I wanna share with you some opportunities in that regard. And you know, those of us who deal with HSP or PLS and we have varying degrees of, of uh, issues that we have to deal with, but no matter what those difficulties are, uh, most of us are uh, on computers, on iPads, we do research, we have cell phones and we can stay connected to the world, connected to other people everywhere. And so while you may think you can't do anything to make much difference with this effort, we want to encourage you. We want to tell you that we don't think that's right. We want to tell you that there are opportunities uh, from, from spending time on the phone to thinking about putting on a community fundraiser and everything in between. And we need your involvement, your knowledge of the foundation and your support in every way that you can. We are a nonprofit corporation, as Frank said, uh, incorporated in 2002. And our vision is the day when all individuals with HSP or PLS are diagnosed, treated, and cured. Boy, that's a big task, which you know, with medical research that's being done, it has been done, uh, we are making progress towards some of those treatments and we hope cures. And that's why the public awareness that we talk about to try to raise is so important. But what's our plan? How will we accomplish that vision? Uh, how are we organized and how can you help? Well, our board, there are 13 members on the board. That board meets monthly by teleconference and then once a year by uh, meeting at our annual conference. And we all know we didn't get to do that this year, but that doesn't diminish what the board is trying to do. We just have to do it a little bit differently. But again, you can meet all of those folks on our website if you haven't already had a chance to do that. Uh, and you ought to know every board member or someone in their family has either HSP or PLS, with the exception of Dr. Corey Brostead, who's been on this board for many years, and you'll hear him speak in just a moment, and we appreciate his presence and his work on our behalf. And of course, as Frank did, we want to thank Dr. John K. Fink, uh, Director of Neurogenic Disorders at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He's our medical advisor and he is there all the time to help in any way he can and we appreciate him so much. And you're going to want, want to make sure to uh, sit in and be part of this conference tomorrow because he'll be talking with us tomorrow. And, and uh, we always learn so much from him from one year to the next in terms of what is happening new in the research arena for HSP and PLS. Obviously, one of our greatest priorities is raising dollars to be used for medical research. Uh, you know, we all read about things like CRISPR, stem cell research. We, we, we read about needing to find biomarkers that can be used to look at putting uh, uh, trials in place, cl clinical trials in place, uh, other areas of medical research, but it takes dollars to do that. And so, you know, we're one of those or, or organizations that works hard with our volunteer uh, base to raise that money to help reach those treatments and cures. Our board member, Mark Weber, who was our first president years ago, works with a scientific advisory board annually, continually helping us determine uh, what areas of research 
are most important with the resources that we have and can raise to put into those. That scientific advisory board involves physicians and researchers from all over the globe. And we appreciate their involvement and their time and commitment to helping us analyze and, and evaluate all of those proposals so that we do fund those that hopefully can come closer to helping us with these diseases. Within the organization, uh, we have established two or three active and working committees during this, these past two years. And tomorrow, you'll get the opportunity to hear from each committee chair for just a few moments. So you'll meet them. Uh, you'll know who they are. They'll say a few words about what their committees are doing. I want to share a little bit with that, about that with you today. And I want to tell you, you don't have to be a board member to be on one of these committees. Uh, if you have a professional work or professional or personal experience that have given you uh, knowledge uh, and an opportunity to help in any of these areas. We would like to talk to you about how we can put that to use. Uh, there's plenty of room for everyone who will get involved in helping uh, do this work. Let me talk to you for just a moment about those committees. And I wanna tell you that all of them meet monthly by teleconference uh, and we appreciate their attendance. Uh, Norm and I sit in and work with each of those committees as we do the board and and trying to keep information flowing and working toward the goals and tasks that these committees have developed and are working in. Uh, first, let me talk to you about the fundraising committee. And it's certainly a different time. Uh, when we talk about fundraising, we know all the issues the country and the world are dealing with. Uh, and, and we understand uh, that fundraising and fundraising requests and events have to be a little different now than maybe they've been in the past. But we don't wanna take our eye completely off of that fundraising effort. There are things we can continue still do and plans we can make for events around the corner when we hope things return to a new normal. Um, our fundraising committee is chaired by Jim Sheon, who, who is from Nashville. Uh, Jim is a former president of this organization uh, from a few years ago, so he's been working with Best PF in a number of capacities, and we appreciate his leadership, his willingness to chair this committee. Um, we hear from Jim almost daily with emails of work that he's doing, and we appreciate his work. And let me mention some of that, and I know committee members are working with him in this as well, but grant research and grant writing. Uh, over the past year, uh, that committee and Jim have probably written and, and submitted 25 or 30 grant applications. If you've never done grant applications, uh, those can be complicated and can be difficult to do. So if you're out there listening and someone in your family or you have got one of these diseases, we might can use you in helping perform some of that grant writing. Jim also advised us, and he'll probably talk tomorrow about something called the Combined Federal Campaign. So if you've got people in your family or friends who work in federal employment, Jim's gonna share with you uh, how you can involve them perhaps in helping us with some fundraising. Uh, virtual awareness campaigns, uh, getting the word out there about who we are and what we're doing. Frank mentioned monthly giving a moment ago. Uh, in the past few years, we've had a number of new people who do that. And I know all of our financial circumstances are different. But if you're out there and you could only do $5 a month, well, that's $60 a year. And if a lot of people do that, that helps fund one grant that we might be able to fund during the next year. So uh, if you have an opportunity to think about monthly giving, that certainly is important and appreciated. One of the arenas that we're looking in and, and working on now is the idea of planned giving. Uh, whether you might put SPF in your will or you might plan in some other way to help fund this research, uh, those are important opportunities. And we can assist this organization, Norma and I and other, other board members, we'll be glad to assist you in thinking about fundraising activities. Uh, a number of those things are we do golf events. We do a golf event annually here in Kentucky. Uh, walks, uh, trivia nights, runs, at this point, virtual events. So if you're willing with you, your family, or a group where you are to think about those things, let us know and we'll be glad to give you some ideas and some assistance in getting those ideas off the ground. Another committee that we have is our marketing committee. 
that committee is chaired by Tim Krogan. Uh, Tim has been our MC at the last uh, two uh, annual conferences, so many of you have met Tim there. Uh, Tim's an active, hardworking young man. He's the husband of our board member, Tina Krogan, and so uh, the two of them work hand in hand together, and we, we appreciate them. What's marketing committee doing? Well, focused on getting the word out about, about these diseases, about the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation, who we are, what we are, how we work, and how we need help to reach our goals. Uh, rare diseases, these two diseases are two of some 7,000 rare diseases. I did not realize there were that many until I got involved with this work. That means that there are 7,000 other organizations out there trying to make people aware of what they have and try to raise money uh, to, to fund research and other opportunities related to their diseases. That makes it so critical that we do the very best job we can of getting that information out. Uh, a couple of ways we've done that during the past year. We have uh, worked with a company to create what's called geofencing around some of our larger medical conferences where our diseases might be mentioned, or different neurology conventions and so forth. What's a geofence? Well, when you bring up your internet or your whatever, and they're always uh, beside their advertisements that come up, and sometimes you click on those and see those, we did that as part of these conferences so that some of the neurologists, some of the citizens and patients that might be there might for the first time hear about Spastic Paraplegia Foundation and who we are and what we're trying to do. So we're trying to get that word out and we appreciate the work that Tim and his committee are doing. They've also worked very, diff uh, very hard in the past year or two, uh, continually on our website. Websites change all the time. Uh, we're always looking at upgrades and updates so that you get the best information in the most meaningful way. And we want to thank uh, committee member Hank uh, Chuppy from uh, Chicago. Hank has uh, become a great friend. He works so hard. And Hank, uh, we thank you so much for your work in that regard. Also, the Spastic World Electronic Newsletter. Uh, we hope all of you are getting that. If you are not, go onto the website and you can uh, register and get hooked in to that. Um, Synapse, a quarterly newsletter. Uh, Mr. John Staley, a former board member from Texas, is so faithful, works so diligently, and puts together a great newsletter that gets information out to you. And if you've never seen that, you want to subscribe and get that. And again, you can do that on the website. And it has information about everything uh, in terms of uh, activities among states, about fundraising, about networking. Uh, you need that. It also has articles in there that some of you could write. Hank would love to have uh, articles for this, the uh, electronic newsletter, and John Staley would love to have that same information for that newsletter. Things like exercises that you may do or know about, uh, changes you might make in your home, in your car, that make living with your uh, condition and your disease easier. So make sure you get hooked into those resources. Another committee that's working diligently is our education committee. And that education committee is chaired by Tina Krogan, who is a board member and has served the board as a board member since 2012. And that committee is fo focused on making language more user friendly for our website and all of our communications. And they work closely with uh, our state ambassador program. Uh, many of those monthly calls have got our state ambassadors coming in and talking and learning and participating more in these educational activities. So, uh, state ambassadors are very important. Let me speak a moment about them as Frank did a moment ago. Jackie Wellman from Iowa has been involved as a board member for many years and works particularly with state ambassadors. She and Tina and others are working to make sure we've got state ambassadors in every state. And in some states, in many states, it's good to have more than one state ambassador. What does an ambassador do? You're available when when we learn about someone new in your state, to communicate with them, whether by email, maybe by phone, to talk to them about their having learned about us and having learned about their physical conditions and how they can benefit uh, from being involved with this foundation. We need ambassadors in every state. And I think as of now, we have ambassadors in every state with I think three exceptions. So if you're listening today, uh, we particularly need ambassadors, I'm told, in Indiana, New Hampshire, 
and Alaska. So uh, please look around, see if you can help find state ambassadors, or if you're willing to serve in that capacity along with others, uh, please let us know. We appreciate all of that work. Another thing we're working on right now is uh, increasing our advocacy role, uh, being better prepared as an organization to talk to our elected officials at every level, but particularly the federal level as they look at uh, legislation that may affect uh, our communities. And we all know right now they've got their hands full. And, and as they do what they do, we can't lose sight of the fact that it's important for us to keep lines of communication open with them. Uh, we're working directly with uh, NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, and they represent all those 7,000 rare diseases and disorders, but we will be working with them to keep up with what's going on in Washington. We will try to get word to you on things that you might assist us in that by, by writing or emailing your congressman, uh, your United States senators, and helping get that word, because I guarantee you, the people from Kentucky in Washington like hearing from me, but it also matters when yours and your state hear from you. So we'll be talking more with you about that in the future. Annual conference, just a quick word about that. Uh, we really are missing this annual conference this year. This is a new time for us. Virtual conference, we hope we all find works well. We hope you all enjoy the information you're getting. And we will try to extend that into the future between now and the end of August, as Norma mentioned earlier. Uh, we want to tell you about the annual conference, real, a couple of things real quickly, though. Annual conference is not, is not a fundraiser uh, normally. Now, we appreciate so much many of you who may have registered this year ahead of time. And then when we had to cancel it, many people donated your registration fee. So this year it, it was a, a a fundraiser unintended. But normally the annual conference is not a fundraiser. The foundation generally spends a little more money than we take in in registrations to put that event on. But that's important because we want to bring these communi this community together. We want to get to know one another. We want to learn how we can do more successful business toward finding cures and treatments for these diseases. So we hope next year to be back with an annual conference. We're currently looking at St. Louis as a location to do that. We also will be looking at continuing to do this virtually since we've learned how to do this this year. Uh, so that if you can't come, maybe you can still participate in at least a part uh, of the annual conference uh, in another location. When we begin to do that next year, though, let me tell you now, as soon as we make available the opportunity to register, please don't wait. Please register as quickly as you know you are coming. That helps us in planning both for you and for the foundation. And we appreciate that very, very much. A couple of other things real quickly that are happening and, and are new. Um, and our board is involved in this. Uh, we have got a new group uh, involving children and younger adults up to the age of 25. Uh, we're trying to involve younger people in the activities of the foundation helping them understand and know what we're doing to make a difference, help, helping get them information about these conditions and diseases so they can be better prepared as they move into their future, and just to support them as young people. Uh, there is a private Facebook group that's been established, uh, private obviously, for uh, those young people to feel free to talk uh, and be involved. And if you want to be involved in that, again, you can contact us by email and we'll try to help you get connected to that. Finally, our website. Continue to get on that website. There's a lot of information in there and you have to look hard to find some of it because there's a lot there. But you can learn about our organization, about our history, about the resources that are available, about SNAPs, uh, about exercises and daily living activities, about equipment uses and lifestyle. So website is important. Go on that and learn all you can. We wanna invite you we want to almost beg you to dig in, learn about the foundation, because we're all there as volunteers. We're all there as people who have one of these diseases and who are working hard to make life better for the future. I'll tell you the reason I'm here. In 2014, I was invited to serve as a board member. And the reason I'm here, like many of you, 
I have two children and five grandchildren. And with SPG4, they each have a 50% chance of having to deal with this disease. If I can work with a group of other people and help find some answers that might make their life better in the future, that's why I'm here. So we invite you, we encourage you to get involved with this organization. Email us your questions. Uh, we'll talk to you for just a couple of more minutes uh, in the morning. But right now, it's my great pleasure, as Frank mentioned just a moment ago, to introduce you our speaker for this evening. Uh, Corey Brosted joined this board in October of 2008. Uh, he's a scientist and vice president and general manager of genomics, Covent's drug discovery. He receives his PhD in molecular, cellular biology and biochemistry at Brown University for his work in the field of DNA repair, which is important for our group. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And we appreciate so much Corey. And not only do we appreciate Corey, but we appreciate Corey's family. His daughter, Lauren, comes to our meetings. She helps with our youth and our young people, and she's involved with that group that I mentioned just a moment ago. So Corey Brosted, thank you, my friend and my fellow board member, and we now give you the floor, sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure, can you hear me okay? Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I'm not sure you guys can hear me. Uh, Corey, everybody can hear you. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Sorry about that. Um, I feel pretty humbled by uh, this sort of introduction, and I kind of feel humbled by it every year with such amazing people involved as, uh, you know, Dr. Fink, especially Dr. Fink, folks like Stefan Zuckner, you know, folks like uh, Craig Blackstone, and, uh, you know, people that have, have written on some of these subjects that have been part of the board before, like uh, Dr. Malin Dollinger. Um, it's, it's good to see him, you know, on this today. And uh, certainly he's, he's written far more eloquently than I can tonight present to you on some of these topics. But I do want to, and I'm probably the only speaker who's going to not present their own work. And I'm fine with that as a scientist because we keep getting feedback from this community that uh, most of the people that are that are joining each of our conferences, and probably that's the same with, with this virtual conference, that most folks are new. Uh, up to 75% of the folks are new, either new to the community or it's their first time attending conference. And hey, maybe something like a Zoom conference can actually uh, um, you know, reach out even further than it might otherwise. Uh, but we get feedback that people want to be sure that they understand some pretty complex scientific topics like, I put in here, basic genetics. That can be seen as an oxymoron where, you know, most people do not consider genetics basic. But I want to be able to go through and have it be as approachable as possible because this, th these are diseases that affect our families. And I want to make sure that you've got information at your fingertips and that you, if you have questions, I want to make sure that you can address those. So we try to make this as approachable as possible. Um, so I'm going to start talking some about basic genetics. And frankly, some of your kids or maybe some of the, the younger people in your families might be doing this in, uh, you know, even grammar school, whereas in my generation, it was uh, more high school and maybe college. Um, and some people have not had exposure at all. So, you know, talk to some of your or get exposure to, for, to some of the younger members of your family. They can probably have some experience here. And I do have some previous talks from, from prior years that address some of this topic as well. And it could be useful to revisit some of that on our YouTube. Um, after this basic genetics piece, I'm going to go on and give a little bit of an update on therapy. Um, and so I've already seen a few questions of, of people talking about inheritance patterns and things. I'll cover a little bit of that with basic genetics. And then I am going to move on to things like therapies. I've heard um, uh, the speakers so far talk about the promise of CRISPR, promise of things like uh, pluripotent stem cells. Um, I've talked a lot about therapies like ASOs. You'll learn what an ASO is, an antisense oligo. Uh, these are all different types of therapies, and I'll talk about them generally as cell and gene therapies. And again, try to make it approachable. So 
Um, I'm used to talking to a live audience here and I want to understand questions, especially if I'm not being clear. Um, so we're gonna have to come back maybe and address some of those questions, but um, I'm gonna do the best job I can remotely. Uh, let's see, let me see if I can get my next slides. Let me just start off by talking a little bit about DNA uh, and I hate starting with an acronym, but DNA maybe is a common an acronym, but it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, which is why DNA is a heck of a lot easier to say. Um, and I wanna talk about the fact that this is a genetic blueprint. I have dedicated most of my life to a DNA molecule. Oh, and I also wanna say, I'm not a clinician. All those people I called out earlier, those are clinicians. They will be able to help you with medical issues. I'm nothing but a lab rat. And I love being a lab rat. That's my comfort zone. And I love talking to people about it. But uh, just know this is, is my comfort zone in the lab, knowing the molecular pieces. I am not an expert on medical conditions or you know any of, of the phenotypes that all of you are witnessing. So um, please direct those questions, obviously, to John Fink. But I'm happy to, to talk about the science. So what I want to talk to you about here is so DNA is the genetic blueprint. This is the material, the genetic material that's been passed on for all of the generations. And it's stored in a nucleus of each and every cell. And I usually ask the audience, but how many cells do you think we have in a human body? Um, if you say that it's in the trillions, then you're right. It's multiple trillions of cells. Each one of these cells, so like if you even take like a, you know, a fingernail and I've got, I've got my HSP bracelet on. If you kind of take your fingernail, I'm going to scrape, you've got, uh, you know, uh, cells that you scrape off. That is cellular material. And in, inside each and every one of those cells are these structures called chromosomes. In each and every chromosome, there are 40 or each and every one of these cells in these nuclei, there are 46 chromosomes. 23 pairs in every cell. And the reason why chromosomes are in pairs is you're inheriting 23 from your mom, you're inheriting 23 from your dad. So every cell in your body is half from your mom and half from your dad in these pairs of chromosomes. And this is what a chromosome actually looks like. It's extremely structural. It has, it has form. It, has, it, it may be very small, but it has a feel to it. There's actually a structure to it. And if you stretch that out, that's where you get this sequence that you may realize DNA is made up of. Here, there, you can see that they're called base pairs. All DNA is, is a long structure that's perpetuated generation after generation. And in your cells, as your cells divide, cell to cell to cell, that is nothing more than a series, a long polymer of base pairs. Let me go and show you a little bit more about what those base pairs look like. So DNA is made of these letters or base pairs. It's also called nucleotides. These are just fancy words for a code. And that code is this C-A-G-T that you may have read about in the paper. Uh, you may actually see this commonly or hear about it. And if you look at this picture, if you look at the code, you can actually read it in this direction, A, G, T, A, C, G, okay? It's a very stable structure, a very stable code. It's no different from how your computer reads a hard drive. It's reading a code. This is exactly the same. It's just incredibly stable. It's amazing how stable it is, okay? But all it is is you can read that code linearly down the stretch. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to go to my next slide. It's this DNA code that determines everything about what your cells make, how you look, how you function, how, your, how you can see because you, you, your organs, your visual organs actually uh, allow you to be able to see and transmit to your brain. It's this code that determines everything. So here, what you can see is there's the DNA, what's called a coding strand, all right? And that actually gets transcribed. And I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm talking about transcription. It's, it's an advanced topic, but 
it's very important, especially in terms of therapies that we're going to be talking about. So you actually transcribe this into a temporary copy. It's, again, a code. Just like DNA, remember I said, is a code. The RNA is also a code. You can make an exact copy of it. But the RNA molecule that you're transcribing is a temporary copy. So the DNA is transmitted generation through generation through generation. RNA is what gets is, is a copy of, I almost refer to it as, you know, if the DNA is like a blueprint for your house, the RNA is like, here's the, the building or the, the buy list for what you need to build for what you need to buy at the uh, hardware store that day. It's temporary. It's not part of the blueprint, but it's derived from the blueprint, right? So you make this RNA that actually gives you some instruction that you go and you buy your materials at the hardware store for that day. Then there's a process called translation, which again is a different kind of code where you're reading that RNA and making it into amino acids. And I usually ask uh, the audience at this point, you know, ha have you heard of amino acids? Most people have heard of amino acids either in like protein supplements or some sort of dietary supplement, or maybe in like a shampoo or some side of, you know, uh, uh, a complex or, or fancy kind of uh, um, hair product. But what you, what you can see here is this code is translated into yet another code, but these are proteins. A protein is what actually has structure and function. And that's what I'm gonna say in my next slide. So down here, I've got kind of a cheat sheet here, even though these are all uh, fancy pictures. This is what really matters. Proteins are the things that have structure and function. So I, I scraped up my skin cell before. Your skin is stretchy and it can move because that's important for skin to do. If your skin is brittle, then it would crack. You need skin that has a structure and function. And that is to be flexible and bendable and be able to cover you and heal itself. That's because of proteins. Now, DNA doesn't allow your skin to have structure and function. It codes for the pieces that make a protein that has structure and function. Does that make sense? All right. So I'm going to keep moving along. Proteins, again, I use the, the example of stretchy skin. Think of it again in that house metaphor. Think of it as the two by fours in the walls or maybe a window pane that's in your window. Or you can kind of see in the back of my, of my screen, you can kind of see a map that's, that's on my wall. Think of maybe proteins kind of look like a map that's in your body that actually has a structure and function. You can feel it, right? It's got, uh, it, it may be like a light switch where it's got a function where it can be in an on position or in an off position. You can think of some proteins as being like a key in a lock, where literally there's a protein that can fit into a lock, unlock an activity, and then do something. There's, there are about 30,000 different kinds of proteins that allow a body, any kind of organism, call it a bacteria, a yeast, a human being, a dog, any of those things, there's about 30,000 different kinds of proteins that are in all of our different kinds of cells that allow us to be those organisms and do those things we do. Pretty amazing. It all comes from DNA. Again, RNA is that intermediate. And then you go and you make proteins that have structure and function. And all they are is codes. We figured out this code in about the 50s, which wasn't that long ago. All of the stuff that we've been able to do is based upon that early work that was in the 50s. All right, so let me go back. If you have a code, what can go wrong? One of the things that happens all the time, anytime that you're living, anytime you're exposed to the sun, anytime there's a, a, a replication, a division, uh, or copying of that DNA, you can have mistakes. Mistakes in DNA can, and sometimes, it can sometimes be called mutations. It's a change. Now, only changes that in your, in your gametes, that are in your sperm or in your egg cells, get transmitted to the next generation. But if you've got a mistake, that can actually cause a different kind of protein. And so you can kind of see this code right here, right? This TCA, GAG, GTG right here. 
What if one of these became GAG? If you look here, it's going to code for a different amino acid, which might make a different protein that has a different structure and function. Maybe it'll make a two by four that's got kind of a twist in it. Or maybe your key going into your lock doesn't fit anymore, in which case it doesn't have the function that you expect and the function that you need. So if you've got a change in your code, that can have an impact on your protein. And in some cases that can manifest as a disease, okay? So a lot of cases of spastic paraplegia, and we're still trying to find some of the genetic causes of PLS are because of a change that causes the symptoms that you have. And a lot of times it is one simple change. It can be a more complex change and I'll show a, what a few other changes look like, but it is a change in your code that can be transmitted to the next generation and we'll talk about inheritance patterns, but it's because you've got a change in your sequence that makes a change in your protein that changes the structure and function. You heard Frank talk earlier about microtubules. Some of the phenotypes and some of the genes that we're looking at are about uh, literally a microtubule is like a two by four that grows only at one end and it can only grow. And if you have a protein that can only grow, you don't want a two by four that goes all the way through your roof, your roof's gonna leak. You need to be able to cut that two by four at the other end. And one of the, the, the manifestations of disease is there's a problem with that protein that cuts that two by four. So you can only get bigger, you can't get shorter. And that causes some of the neuronal phenotypes that we see and changes in the ability to transmit signals down a neuron. So you can see changes that are simple in a code if it's in the wrong protein, can have very important consequences in your cells and cause disease. All right, so that's taking something that is usually pretty darn complicated like genetics and bringing it down to it's just a code and it's screwing something up. In some cases, you can make things better with a change, but usually it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a problem. A lot of times you can have changes and it makes no difference whatsoever, but in some cases it can cause disease. All right. What are some other types of changes in DNA? So remember, all it is is a code. So you can think of a few different ways you can have changes in that code. You can have a deletion where a whole section is missing. Instead of just maybe one base that's missing, maybe it's a bunch. You think that might have an issue? It could, it might not be an issue, but it also could be an issue. We definitely find that deletions cause some diseases. A translocation, remember I told you that there's these structures called chromosomes. If you end up having a piece of a chromosome that flips to a whole other area of a chromosome, of a different chromosome, that can be called a translocation. You actually got uh, sections that shift. And then you've got a break in your code. So you can imagine that might cause an issue. And I should say that along these chromosomes, um, usually I say this earlier, you can almost think of this as like an address. Um, say that this is an entire town and maybe, you know, a street that you live on is maybe a little piece of, of this. And the house that you live in is maybe one smaller piece. That would be where a gene is and that's what's uh, coding for a particular protein. So if you have an entire region that's deleted, you might actually have a lot of genes are delete, that are deleted. And that might affect, again, those genes make proteins. And so you might have a lot of proteins affected there. You can have an inversion where uh, an area is just flipped, so you don't have gain or loss of genes, but it's actually flipped. Um, and then you can have these single gene changes that are, are more like those single nucleotide changes that I mentioned before, those, you know, 1A for a G, for instance. All right, so usually I try to do a gut check here, and sometimes we call audience members up to actually be a protein, uh, but we can't do that very easily virtually, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on, and I wanna be able to get on to therapies um, as soon as I can. So again, if you've got questions, please don't hesitate to um, uh, check previous YouTube videos or ask me and we can follow up with those after. Let me talk briefly about inheritance pattern. Somebody already asked about this before. They said, you know, what's the inheritance pattern? I think of SPG3. So I wanna go through that. I don't wanna dwell on it too much, but I wanna talk about it some. 
Um, my daughter, who's in school looking to, to be a genetic counselor, is going to be uh, probably the family expert in this real darn soon, but I'll do my best. Um, so just a little bit about diseases. So virtually all diseases have a genetic component, but not every disease is a genetic disease. So there are things called Mendelian diseases, and Mendel was one of the original people that figured out this code. And this was back in the late 1800s. So he didn't figure out the code, but he figured out some important breakthroughs. If you look at Mendelian diseases, there are some examples you may know about, like Huntington's disease, a CMT is a Charcot-Marie tooth disease, different types of cancers, spastic paraplegia. These are examples of Mendelian disease. We know a lot about the genetics of these diseases. Then there's things that are a little bit more complex that maybe have a little bit more of an environmental impact, things like Alzheimer's that we don't fully understand. It doesn't look to be 100% genetic. Things like cardiovascular disease that obviously, you know, folks like me that maybe need to lose a few pounds, it's, the, it's your environment. I'm doing some of this myself. I may have a predisposition, but some of the things that, uh, you know, I eat that I like to eat on a Friday night uh, might not necessarily help me with cardiovascular disease. And things like cancer, sometimes we're exposed to environmental complexities, things like asbestos that we know can cause significant lung cancer. Uh, so, you know, there are combinations in some of these complex diseases where, uh, you know, it's both environment and genes. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of diseases that are actually mostly environmental, but even those have a predisposition for uh, 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 some genetic components. So we're going to be focusing on Mendelian diseases here, but they're not the only category. So let me focus on those. These are really the rarest of medical conditions, although I did, I mean, Frank, I mean, you're, you're doing an amazing job with your introduction. You're talking about the fact that there is, you know, 7,000, 8,000 of these rare diseases. There are a lot. And if you add all of those up, it's about 10% of the population that has a rare disease. All of a sudden, rare isn't so rare. But for any one disease, it is quite rare within the population. And that can be a challenge, especially as, you know, there are physicians that need to treat they can't know about all 8,000. So you need to have amazing folks like, you know, Dr. Fink and, and some of the other uh, medical experts um, that'll be presenting this weekend and this year um, who, who just are so knowledgeable in this area. So for Mendelian diseases, the genetic change is often in one gene. Although we know for spastic paraplegia, there are about, uh, there's at least, I, I think, 80 that are well-defined. Dr. Fink keeps asking me how many how many it's up to, and I ask him what his newest research is showing, there's probably a couple hundred of, of these genes that actually cause disease. The inheritance patterns of these genes are well known, and I'll go through a little bit what, what dominant and recessive are, and we talked a little bit about that. I think that uh, uh, it may have been Frank that mentioned uh, that, that he's got a dominant uh, disease and has a 50% chance of passing it on. I'll show you a little bit about that. Environment and exposures have very little impact in this case. Your genetics are your genetics. It's very hard to escape those. There can be variation, uh, but it's not primarily caused by environment. It's caused by genetics. So a little bit about Mendelian disorders. So autosomal versus X-linked. Um, I didn't go through chromosomes. Remember I said that you've got 23 pairs, 46 chromosomes. 44 of them are autosomes. Two of them are sex chromosomes. And remember, you get half your chromosomes from your mom, half your chromosomes from your dad. So the sex chromosomes determine if you're going to become male or female. And those are called uh, sex-linked chromosomes, okay? The one that you get from your mom is X-linked. Your X chromosome has an enormous amount of genes on it, a lot. What you get from your dad is a Y chromosome if you become a son, all right? And that uh, is your sex chromosome. So those two are special chromosome. The other two are autosomal. So the first question that we usually ask is, is the gene on a chromosome that determines your gender, that determines your sex? The other question is, is it dominant or is it recessive? And that's all about how many copies of the gene are necessary to cause the phenotype. So let's go through the example of autosomal dominant. Autosomal means it's on one of those 22 chromosomes, not the sex chromosomes. And dominant means that one allele in a gene pair can contain a polymorphism, 
and that all individuals with that mutation are affected or predisposed to develop the condition. That means you only need to inherit it from either your mom or your dad. If you have the chance to get that chromosome that has that gene pair, that has that polymorphism, you've inherited that disease. There is therefore a 50% recurrence risk for all offspring. If you have a disease, you have a 50% chance of passing that on to your son or daughter. And it doesn't matter if they're a son or daughter because it's not on the sex chromosome, it's on an autosome. Males and females are equally affected. Examples of this in neurology are Huntington's disease, that's an autosomal dominant disease, uh, tuberous sclerosis, TSC, many forms of spastic paraplegia, including the most common, SPG4. Someone asked earlier about SPG3A. This is autosomal dominant. And I'll show an example in a moment of that, that kind of brings this home um, of how this looks in a family. SPG6 and SPG31 are also pretty common, and those are, are each autosomal dominant. So again, if you have two healthy copies of the gene, you're, you are healthy. But if you have just one allele, a copy of a gene is called an allele, uh, that causes disease, it will cause disease in that individual. If you are unlucky enough to have two copies, that also causes disease, and sometimes that's actually incompatible with life. You might not actually be able to develop into a viable embryo. So just one copy will cause disease. And here's what that looks like when you have a father that has a genetic condition. Remember, they've got two copies of every chromosome. So this is one of his chromosomes, this is the other of his chromosomes, and this little area here marks a mutation that shows they have disease, that they've got a mutation in that gene. And if he has a child with a mother that again has two healthy chromosomes, they've got a combination of matches of chromosome here, a healthy chromosome and a healthy chromosome, one from mom, one from dad. Here, this possibility is the mutated chromosome coming from dad and a healthy one from mom. You can see that this child is a child with the genetic condition because they have that one copy and it's dominant. Here's another possibility. They can order, they can inherit this chromosome from mom, this chromosome from dad, this child does not carry the gene and does not have the disease. Again, this chromosome coming from mom, this chromosome coming from dad, this is a child that can have the disease. So there's four different possible combinations of inheritance, but in this case, 50% overall of the children will have the genetic condition. 50% of the children will not have the condition. And it doesn't matter if they're boys or girls. If, 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 maybe listen to this a few times or look at some of the other material that we've put on YouTube if you wanna hear this described a different way. And I'll go through the, uh, the same inheritance pattern with uh, recessive to see if that makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so let me talk about autosomal recessive. Again, we're talking about not on the sex chromosomes, we're talking about on autosomes. And in recessive, both alleles in a gene pair must contain a pathogenic mutation. Individuals with one allele are considered a carrier and are not affected. You can have that pathogenic mutation and never show any symptoms of disease your entire life, but you're at risk of passing that on to your children. So that's where autosomal diseases can sometimes look to skip generations and it can sometimes be a bit of a mystery but if you, if you have this in your family and you talk with somebody like a genetic counselor, like my daughter is, is, is trained to be, they will be able to go through your family tree and pretty quickly and efficiently, in most cases, be able to understand if you're looking at a potential autosomal recessive or any sort of recessive condition, if you know enough about your family. And in plenty of cases, you don't. If there's you know, adoptions and so forth, um, you might not know your family history or perhaps some of your ancestors died early enough that they didn't have manifestation of disease, but a lot of times you can figure this out. So you can carry one allele and be totally healthy. 
there's a 25% recurrence risk for offspring if both parents are carriers for that gene. And we'll go through and, and I'll show you what that is. Again, this isn't on the sex chromosome, so male and females are equally affected. And there's a few big examples in neurology. SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, it's actually been in the news because uh, it's another motor neuron disease and it has had a couple of effective therapies lately. I'm gonna talk a lot about some of these therapies. This is a big one, and this is a classic autosomal recessive, one of the most common autosomal recessive diseases. Um, there are Friedrich's ataxia is a common form of ataxia uh, in terms of rarity. Um, a few uh, uh, spastic paraplegia genes include SPG5A, SPG7, SPG11, 1535. These are all examples of autosomal recessive genes. So let me show you what that looks like. Again, if you've got two healthy copies of genes, you're gonna be healthy, you're gonna be unaffected. If you have one copy, um, uh, one mutated copy of a gene, you are going to be healthy, but you're a carrier. You're at risk of passing that on to your children, but you yourself will not show symptoms. Any individual that has two mutations in your copies, two alleles, are going to demonstrate disease. You're going to have the disease. Everyone is a carrier of autosomal recessive conditions. And I wanted to show a few people that are pretty amazing in this world. And you need to know a lot of people or a lot, everyone is a carrier of at least 25 or so, maybe more pretty serious diseases. Everyone is, and they just may not show symptoms. So, you know, even Tom Brady, who uh, uh, abandoned my poor uh, patriots, of whom I'm such a fan in the Northeast, even he is a carrier of many autosomal recessive conditions. Um, everyone is. It is a totally normal thing, and you may not even know that you're a carrier unless you're tested. So if you look at two carriers that happen to be unlucky enough that they actually are carriers of the exact same gene, and might not ever know it. For instance, SMA. Here's an example where a father is a healthy carrier, has one copy of a mutated gene, healthy copy here. The mother has the same situation, one healthy copy down here and one mutated copy up here. Let's look at the different combinations of chromosomes that they can have. Here is a baby that has mom's unhealthy copy inherited, so they carry the gene. They may, they're not going to show symptoms themselves, remember, because you need two copies. They may not show it themselves, but they're at risk of passing it on to their children, okay? But they carry. They're healthy. Here, this is a child, again, 25% chance. It's, it, you just have a 25% chance of inheriting this chromosome uh, from dad and this chromosome from mom happens to inherit both the disease genes this is a child that will have the genetic condition. Here's a combination where this child, the 25% chance of getting two healthy copies, one healthy copy from mom, one healthy copy from dad, perfectly healthy and has zero chance of passing this on to their, their offspring, okay? It's important to know. Here's the, again, that last 25% chance, one um, mutated copy, one healthy copy, again, healthy baby, healthy uh, adult, but at risk of passing that on to their child. So again, 25% chance in this scenario where with two carriers, 25% chance of a child with uh, uh, showing disease. Okay, so that's what I had to talk about with inheritance patterns. If I go into much more detail, it's gonna take a lot more time and time is a little bit my enemy here. I wanna be sure to go on and be able to talk about gene and cell therapy updates, but I'm going to hearken back to my uh, uh, talk about genetics, about RNA, about structure, function, proteins. So the reason I wanted to talk so much about that is because it's very relevant as we talk about cell and gene therapy updates. So I've shown this slide and unfortunately, uh, um, um, well, no, fortunately, there's an enormous amount of an explosion, really, of, of successful therapies that have been going through the FDA recently in the area of rare disease. But I've talked about a lot of these the last couple of years. 
I'm not going to talk about them tonight. Talk, go look at my talks from 2019, 2018 that are on YouTube to be able to go into some of the detail of these approvals. One of the, the SMA was, it feels like it was approved yesterday. It was approved back in December of 2016. Uh, there was, you know, the first blindness uh, a gene therapy approved in 2017. The second SMA therapy was approved just last year, about a year ago um, uh, in the area of SMA, two therapies in SMA, which is a motor neuron disease, a, a lot like uh, uh, our diseases. Um, these are a couple of examples of recent breakthroughs and there's a lot more examples, but I can't talk about them all. I want to address something that is new and frankly really invigorating for me that is relevant for this patient community. So I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about CRISPR. I'm going to talk about um, gene replacement therapy. I'm going to talk about CAR-T, but I'm really going to focus on an area called antisense oligos. And that sounds like a really fancy big word, call it ASO. I'm gonna talk about what an antisense oligo is. It's just a code. All it is is a code, just like DNA, just like RNA. I'm gonna show you how it works, okay? I'm gonna focus on that a lot today, almost the rest of my talk. And it's not because CRISPR isn't important, but boy, if you haven't read uh, Malin Dollinger's um, a review uh, written in plain English, but really excellent scientific material. Uh, it was in an episode of Synapse, uh, it, I think it, it may have been a year ago. Uh, it's amazing. And frankly, it goes into more detail in CRISPR and Cas9 than I'll have time to do today. And I've talked about that in previous years. Go look at those videos, go read Malin's review. Um, but I, but I don't, I, I don't want to gloss over it because it's so important. And you guys have, to, I've already seen questions about CRISPR, so I'll talk about it a little bit here. Um, so CAR T is a kind of therapy, especially in cancer, where you're actually taking out tissue. You can actually change that tissue to present, and 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 this this tissue is it's all blood material. So you're taking out immune cells. And you're changing those immune cells to target cancer. And it's working. And it's unbelievable. And we're, I'm, for instance, I work for a drug development company. We are working on hundreds of CAR-T programs. And these are coming into the clinic. And these are used to, for uh, a, a, a wide array of different cancer therapies that have been cures where we've never had cures in, in cancer before. Some of these are, are rather miraculous. It's not going to be as important for our therapeutic area, our indicated indication, but it is a really important part of cell and gene therapy today. Again, gene editing with CRISPR-Cas9, I'm not going to be able to do it justice today. There are videos on it. Here is what's important about CRISPR and Cas9. Remember, DNA is a sequence, and just one change in that DNA sequence can cause disease. With CRISPR-Cas9, there is something called a guide RNA that comes in, and I'll describe it a little bit later, that can actually target a particular sequence and edit it. That's amazing, and it's happening. We're, we used to use that in the lab as a tool in the lab to be able to study things, now we're able to successfully use this to edit cells in a human body and cure disease. It's happening. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a bit of an update on that, but it's not necessarily going to be relevant for this patient community yet, but it, it may be, and it's happening now, and it is curing rare disease. Gene replacement therapy is where you can actually take, not editing just a single nucleotide or part of the code, you're editing, remember on that chromosome, you've got a street address, you've got a, a town, you've got a street, you've got a house where an entire gene, a lot of sequence may be just either taken out and replaced, or you're putting a new gene, a, a well-functioning gene into those cells so that you express the correct protein. So you've got the right two by four, you've got the right key that's fitting into the lock so that you can avoid disease. So that's gene replacement there. That's, that's basically what, what it is. I'm not going to talk a lot about pluripotent stem cells. It's, it's, it's still um, very preliminary. And 
and there there are very few proven techniques there. But uh, it's it's a hot area. I know it's it's a subject of of much debate. Uh, there's nothing going on with the FDA in this area yet, uh, but it's still a, a really important um, uh, tool that's being used in in uh, in research. All right. So what are some important themes? This is very similar to what I've said the past few years because it's still true. Some important themes are FDA willingness to approve innovative therapies. And I'm going to talk about a specific example where they're not just approving innovative therapies. They're, they're showing a willingness to address clinical trials in a whole new way. It's very exciting. Investment is absolutely through the roof. So 2018 to 2020 is averaging $4.3 billion worth a year. This is big business. Even in a year like this where COVID is overtaking uh, science, social, everything, it still is a very active area because it's such an uh, important area of discovery and, and uh, clinical translation. There are hundreds of gene and cell therapy uh, uh, studies in various stages of research and clinical trials, and drugs are being approved that are helping rare disease populations. So again, I kind of showed that top list and a few that are really up and coming. Um, many of these I can't talk about, but I know a lot about because my company is doing some of this work. There's a lot of companies that are doing a lot of this work and it's happening and it's working. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the different phases of trials next. That's important, but uh, one of my favorites right now is a, a sickle cell and beta thalassemia. These are blood conditions that some, you, you may know about. Um, and this is, again, an example of CRISPR gene editing. Some people were asking about CRISPR gene editing. Is this working? Well, we've got uh, uh, several people that have been edited, their, their, their cells, their blood cells have been edited to cure them of sickle cell and beta thalassemia diseases. It's happening. It hasn't happened in a lot of patients yet, but it's amazing to see. It's uh, something I, I hoped I would see in my lifetime, and it's actually happening. So there's, there's a lot of promise and a lot of hope there. Not in all these areas, but, but in, in a lot. All right. A little bit about clinical trial structure for FDA approval. Um, we have had a pretty terrible history as human beings of how we treat each other sometimes. And so the FDA exists to make sure that human experimentation is done safely. We have been remarkably unsafe in our past and had some pretty egregious examples where we do not respect human life. And so the FDA is there to protect all of us. And there's lots of different countries that have their own version of the FDA. And here is a well accepted approach to having safety as you do important experimentation in humans. Okay, you go through a phased trial where you're looking at phase one, it's all about safety. You're looking at a very small number of humans that are healthy that receive an experimental therapy to say, is this safe? Is this causing harm? These are volunteers, never people that don't volunteer, which used to be the case in some of our human history. So this phase is really important and it's all about safety. Uh, phase two typically is about efficacy. Is there an, an improvement, a placebo controlled dose? Sometimes it might escalate. Sometimes you're comparing like in rare diseases to a natural history where you're looking to say, hmm, this person would have gotten more sick but these people that are treated maybe did not. A placebo is an important way to distinguish in a blinded fashion people that don't get therapy and people that do, and that can seem quite cruel in a world where a sick population doesn't get a drug as part of a clinical trial. It can seem quite cruel, but it's because we need to understand with science if there is an improvement, if there is a change, this is important for the rest of generations. Often, people that volunteer to be part of a clinical trial in phase two that were part of the placebo group, we try to shut that trial down as quickly as possible if you see improvement. So the folks that were not getting drug, all of a sudden are able to get drug. Almost all drug companies do that 
and they provide it often for the rest of their lives as as a just a, a thank you that can never be repaid to those families that are part of a medical process that can be very difficult. So, you know, as part of being part of a clinical trial, you're improving the world forever. And that is an important thing that's recognized in phase two. Phase three and phase four become just kind of larger versions of this. And in rare disease, it's very hard to imagine what phase three and phase four look like because there's such a small patient population. So a phase three might be, you know, for like cholesterol drugs, where all of a sudden you're looking at, you know, tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of patients. And phase four is often when you already have a drug and you're looking to monitor, continuously monitor if there are other issues with that drug after it's already been made available in human beings. So this is a, a way that we'll talk more about this as clinical trials are relevant for our patient community. It is a whole new world for this community because it can be contentious, it can be challenging, and we want everyone to understand these phases so that you know what may be coming, uh, and we can look to other diseases that are going through this right now. I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. So a little bit about what is cell and gene therapy. Again, um, I, I talked some about you can alter the DNA sequence of an organism for purposes of treating disease. That's called gene therapy, whether you're editing a single nucleotide or whether you're treating it with an entire gene, a gene replacement. You're looking to change the targeted, um, you're ch looking to change uh, a targeted region, and you're looking to correct enough cells to actually help with that disease, to change enough neurons that the motor neurons become healthier. Uh, it doesn't have to be all necessarily, but you want to be able to change enough that it actually changes the course of disease. And this is, I'm not able as a lab rat, I'm not able to know if we're changing enough to cause disease. I would need an expert like John Fink to know, is there actually a change in the outcome? Is there a change in the phenotype? Is a patient improving? So it's a combination of lab people, of clinical people, of you know, experts in lots of different areas to know, all right, here's an idea, let's try it, and is it working? Uh, some of this therapeutic genetic material can be delivered to cells via things like an adenoviral vector. You may have heard of AAV, maybe you haven't. It's a way to deliver a genetic payload to a particular location. If you need a bit of a larger genetic payload, there are some lentiviruses that are larger, um, and this is becoming more and more common. Smaller genetic payloads, and again, I told you I was going to talk about ASOs. These are antisense oligos. These are tiny little sequences of RNA. Remember I said everything's a sequence? These are short sequences that are for specific regions of your genome that can be delivered. They're so small, you have to deliver these with lipid nanoparticles. All right? And you can do that in specific uh, tissues. Um, in the case of motor neuron diseases, maybe you can deliver it intrathecally, actually into the space uh, that's in your spinal cord. And that can be a good way with lipid nanoparticles and injecting into that space, you can actually target uh, motor neurons, for instance. Or in your eye, you can actually deliver that into the vitriol. Um, in the lung, you can actually inhale in the case of an aerosol. And I'll go into some of that a, a little bit more. But you need to be able to get that ASO to the right spot. Again, CRISPR, I, I said, you know, I'm not going to talk about CRISPR very much. Let's leave it at this. So it's a natural biological process. It allows bacteria to protect themselves. That's how CRISPR is a process that we just figure out that Mother Nature had already invented. We just figured it out. Now we're trying to use it to our benefit. So CRISPR contains a guide RNA that recognizes a specific DNA sequence, cuts it with a nucleus called Cas9. DNA repair processes actually change it and edit that target DNA sequence in a genome. Pretty darn cool. Trying to translate it into a therapy is a whole different thing, but it is happening. All right, let me give a, uh, an example um, in, in SMA. Remember I said that SMA was the first therapy that was announced was an ASO, antisense oligo. And I'm gonna talk on this some. Very expensive therapies, all right? The gene therapy, the gene replacement is even more expensive, but it's being covered very widely by uh, insurance companies. And I'm part of that patient advocacy group as well. 
And uh, there's been a major shift in that advocacy to actually uh, toward affordability and access. A lot is being put into DC lobbying and state, um, uh, state programs uh, to make sure that this is affordable to families and it's not just a, a, a fantasy that this actually helps families and it is helping families. So it's yet another stage later. I don't want anybody to be too freaked out about costs because these are expensive therapies, but we're seeing that access, it's not perfect, uh, but there's a lot of good work in that area. What I wanna focus on is the fact that this is an ASO because I wanna drill down in my remaining 11 minutes. I, I don't wanna go much past an hour because we can, it's, it's hard to maintain attention for so long, but I do want to drill into ASOs and focus like a laser on it, all right? And here's the mechanism of action of an antisense oligo. There's a few different ways it can help, okay? Remember, this is a short sequence of RNA. If you get this RNA to the right spot, you can have that little antisense oligo. You can kind of see here, you see how it's kind of bumpy? It's got a sequence. It'll stick to that part of the genome to which we've designed it, all right? It's a sequence and it sticks to a sequence. And that can result in targeted mRNA de de degradation. Remember I said that mRNAs are like that um, uh, buy list when you go to the hardware store? Well, if you shouldn't be buying those materials, you want this ASO to effectively cut up that list, that buy list. So you don't buy the wrong stuff. Pretty good, that can avoid disease. In this case, you can have it actually bind and stop splicing. I'm not gonna talk very much about splicing, but that is the mechanism of action in this case. It can actually um, create um, a correct, a corrected buy list at the hardware store. So it would fix it in that way. That's the mechanism of action. In another case, you can actually target again that, uh, that uh, a, a microRNA, which is a slightly different type of, of, of RNA, and it'll sequester something that shouldn't be circulating around. So if there's something that's kind of getting in the way, it'll keep it sequestered and not have it be functional. So those are different mechanisms of actions of ASOs. The reason I'm going into ASOs so much is because I want to spend a few minutes talking about something that's really kind of blown me away and really motivated me in a new way this year. Um, and frankly, it's why I do what I do. Um, Ionis is the company, and I'm gonna go back one, the company that developed this ASO that first was able to treat the SMA population. It has changed these families' lives in the way that we want our lives changed in spastic paraplegia and PLS. Ionis pioneered and is an expert in ASO therapies. More than ASOs, but mostly ASOs. They have focused like a laser on that and have done a lot of groundbreaking work there. What I wanna to talk to you about during the rest of my time is that the founder of Ionis, Dr. Stan Crook, has partnered with volunteers and industrial donations, including my company, and I'm very proud to be part of this. Uh, to start a not-for-profit called Enlorum. And I'm gonna switch and share um, a different um, presentation here and talk a little bit more about Enlorum. We are going to talk about Enlorum with, with our patient community and all of you in a lot more detail later. This is just early days, but I wanted to really give this as, a, as, a, as a, an acute, example of how there's progress toward therapies. So I, I'm able to give this presentation with um, permission from uh, Dr. Stanley Crook. He, he presented to all of us um, on the board and to um, Dr. Fink uh, not too long ago. Uh, and both of us will, will be able to speak to this a, a little bit more later. And Dr. Fink tomorrow may even, may even talk about this some um, I'm not sure if he's planning to, but I wanted to go over a little bit about this. So Enlorum is, again, a not-for-profit company that has all of the power and support of that ASO manufacturing machine that is Ionis. And they're all about serving the N of one patient. 
which is our community. So our HSP community, especially HSP, we're still trying to figure out with PLS which genes cause those Mendelian disorders. We're way ahead of the game with HSP. So we do not mean to ignore by any stretch of the imagination the PLS community. But with spastic paraplegia, we know a lot about those genes. I'm going to focus on that for now, even though it seems unfair to PLS. We're, we're working just as hard on, on PLS to find those, those genetic causes. Remember that HSP can be caused, a lot of it's caused by SVG4, a lot of it's caused by SVG3, but remember there's like 80 different genes, probably more like 200 something genes. A lot of the families that have these mutations are different from one another. They, there may be a lot of families that have a mutation SVG4, but they might have a different letter changed, okay? So one family might be a little different from the other family. That's what's called an N of one. And I, instead of patient, I would say family here, because really it's, it, as a family, you all share the same mutation. You all share the same change, but it's all about this N of one. You might be the only one in the world that has that specific change. SPG4, everyone sharing SPG4 mutations may look pretty similar. They're, they're not identical because those changes are a little bit different. But when you're looking at a therapy, and if we're looking at to, to, to have a therapy that's so specific for that one change, you're an N of one. And that's important to understand. N lorem is all about going after that N of one. And I'm gonna show you why. And lorem's mission is to apply the efficiency, versatility, and specificity of ASOs to charitably provide experimental ASOs to treat patients with ultra rare diseases. And the reason he can do that is because he's been incredibly successful in putting together all of the resources to make a progress toward a therapy. And he has some financial uh, backing there, as you can imagine, as a very successful owner of a company that's developed a successful drug. And what I'll show in some of these slides about Enlorum is his company won't necessarily profitably be able to address N of one, but that doesn't mean that they're not important. They're very important. And Stanley Crook and all of the companies that are providing, including mine, support for this, recognize that therapies that can target just 10 patients or one patient, that is very important. There's a lot of those kinds of patients, but this is a company that's focusing in that area. And let me show you a little bit about why, okay? So, Enlorm has a mission to connect patients in need and investigators. And this is something that I'm getting more involved with, Dr. Fink's getting more involved with, and it's pretty darn exciting. And I'm in, there's a lot of slides here. I'm not going to focus on all of them. We'll go into more detail at some point in the future. But I want to be able to highlight some of what NLORM is all about and what they're looking to do. Okay. So they have a treatment committee. And I believe that Dr. Fink is looking to join this treatment committee. And he is actively investigating how to fuel NLORM with potential patients in our community that might benefit, that will likely benefit. This group is treating an SVG4 patient. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. They have expertise in ASOs, genetics, neurological disease, inborn neurons and metabolism. Oh, they, they have amazing experts. This is, this is quite a group. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about their technological feasibility, a little bit about how, remember I said it's commercial versus charitable. Um, and commercial is when you can address thousands of patients. But N of one, using the same technology, we need a different model. Uh, I want to talk about how the FDA is responding to that. I don't have a lot more time, but I want to talk very high level about some of those pieces. So I'm going to zip through some of these, these slides. I'm going to keep going. So these are various organ systems that IONIS has looked at and has experience with. Central nervous system, intrathecal delivery, 
They know the dose that can be re relevant for therapies that have worked. Uh, they've done the same in liver. They've done the same in lung with aerosols. They've done the same in eye with an actual injection that causes uh, a, a, a dose that is therapeutic. They have all of this knowledge that they can apply to other diseases. Again, Ionis has a very deep pipeline, but they're only going to be able to make money if there's a relatively large patient population that's gonna benefit and be able to pay or have insurance pay. And that doesn't necessarily address the end of one patients. So what they're looking to do is have a quasi pro bono category. So the head of this company spun out this not-for-profit and he's saying, anybody that wants to volunteer from your organization, come help us. Who in the industrial community? So my company does toxicology studies to say, is this drug safe? The FDA requires it because otherwise we can't be doing human experimentation with something that isn't shown to be safe. My company is donating, I think $175,000 per molecule here for it's a few dozen molecules it's just the right thing to do. And it's not a model that we can expand forever, but it's a model that's working now, all right? This is gonna be for small patient communities. And it is going, the idea is, uh, and I gotta, I gotta keep going. The idea is this is gonna be provided free of charge to those patients. It's not gonna be able to address all the patients in our community. It's not gonna be able to address the, um, 121 people that are dialed into this webcast so far, but it is going to impact some of our community soon. I don't know when, I'm trying to figure it out, but wow, I mean, this, this, is, this is just, it, it's an example. It's only one example of what I could have talked about tonight, but I wanted to hone in on this example. Let me go a little bit further here. Regulatory environment. The FDA response to this, meaning that we don't have that typical phased trial the way that I laid out before. This is potentially affecting just one person or one family or 10 families, a small number of The FDA is responding positively to this and sees that this is important and they're uh, willing to adjust their requirements but not relax on safety. So we have to show that these molecules are safe. We need to understand how patients are going to respond to it, but we're willing to go forward with these conversations and go forward with these therapies, these experiments. And, and I think Dr. Fink would say, these are not therapies. These are experiments that are happening. There is no guarantee that this ASO that we're introducing, even if we think it will have a mechanism of action that helps, it is still an experiment that may not be effective. So I'm not looking to sugarcoat or make this better than it is, but this is an amazing step forward in an area that um, is difficult to address. Okay, so let me move on from regulatory. Uh, lots of different diseases. This is an ALS mutation that they're, they're working on. I mean, the ALS is a death sentence. And, and, and usually in, within five years, there's a few rare examples outside of that, that that are very popular and familiar, but AL, ALS is, it's, it, it's, a, it's a motor neuron disease just like ours, and so is SMA, and these are therapies in those motor neuron diseases. Treat, I'm sorry, human experiments in, in those diseases. SPG4 is among them. It's not on this list here but we're in, in preliminary conversations and it, and it looks like that, that's moving forward. Uh, launch of Enlorm was just recently, just a few months ago. Um, some of the founding donors are uh, some of the major pharmaceutical companies with whom Stan has uh, uh, done business and they're donating because they are seeing the power. Um, we're looking to launch, there's a, uh, uh, a request process that Dr. Fink can help us uh, uh, talk about and address. Um, and uh, let's see, the cost per this 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 is is going to be a zero cost per patient in these cases. And you can see my company Covance is working on both uh, the major toxicology 
as well as any genomics workups uh, that, that may be needed in some of these cases. And I couldn't be more happy to be part of that and proud to be part of that. Um, there's obviously limitations. We can go through some of those before, but I wanted to give, uh, they're, they're, it's just loaded with limitations, but I never thought I'd see at this point uh, such charity in this areas and making progress for N of one families. Um, it's gonna take a long time uh, to, to impact us all, but it started, you know, the, these, these processes have started. Okay, um, I think that that's my time. Um, I'd love to be able to ask uh, questions of, of you all, and I think you would want to as well, uh, but I think we'll have some follow-up. And I am going to send this back to Norma uh, so that she can talk about how we can address questions and how we can take next steps in, in, in getting everyone comfortable with some of this very complex scientific uh, 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 field. I don't want it to be a mystery to anybody and uh, hopefully it helped. Thanks very much. Thanks for everything you guys do. Corey, I, I cannot believe all the information that you have shared with us this evening and I'm sure if you could hear all of the clapping that is going on, uh, all the comments, all the questions, all the, you know, thank you so much. Thank you so much. There's so much information there. And I know we're going to get an opportunity to have you to answer questions. And we've got a list of questions that folks have sent to us. And we're going to be getting more questions from people. There's just so much information. And some of it I have to just say is just really kind of over my head. And you, but you make it so informative and there's so much information there that we need to, um, you need to be hearing the thundering claps for uh, your presentation because I'm sure a lot of folks out there uh, very much appreciate you. So thank you so much for being with us tonight and we're gonna get back with you and figure out uh, when we can either let people come on and ask questions directly with you. Uh, and, and also uh, we've got that list that we're building and we're gonna get that to you as well and to Dr. Fink. And then we'll perhaps maybe even do a future uh, Zoom with you with just questions. So thank you so much, sir, for your time this evening. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen with everyone so that we can talk about what's going to happen tomorrow. And I wanted to just remind you uh, that we are going to uh, talk about uh, what's going to happen uh, with questions. I, I did kind of mention that a little bit, but I wanted to go back and I wanted to share with you uh, this information here. So please, if you will, take just a sec couple of minutes here and look at our screen. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're gonna do kind of a repeat of what some of the stuff's going on with our board and our foundation and the work of the board. Uh-oh, okay, something happened here. Sorry about that, folks. You know how technology is. And I know you're all getting tired as we are from all this information, but what you see here is uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we are going to start again the virtual chatter, which is me, and I'm gonna just really basically give you guys time to get online. And I know that some of the uh, technology didn't work for you from what I was reading down through all the chats and the co communication that was happening. But if you happen to lose uh, the ability to see or hear something, just exit out of your screen and then go back to your link and join us again. It could be your internet that's causing those problems and with everything that's happening in everywhere, everybody's on the internet. So just kind of keep that in mind and, and please feel free just to jump off and jump back in whenever you have that opportunity. So that's what I'm coming on to talk to you about is just a few things and to cover a little bit like I did tonight, uh, not a full repeat. Uh, and then also Mr. Davis is gonna come on in the, uh, tomorrow morning and he's gonna talk a few minutes again. For those folks that were not able to join us tonight, we want him to be able to share uh, about what's happened with our foundation. Uh, and then you're gonna be hearing a little bit more detail from each of those committee members, uh, the committee chair that Greg had mentioned earlier, the work of the foundation. You know, we are all in this together, right? And what we want is for everyone that whatever your expertise is in your life, what we want is for you guys to be involved. 
you know, whatever your life's, you know, work is, you surely have an opportunity that you can um, make a contribution, not just a financial contribution, of course, but a contribution with your skills, with your ability to do whatever it is that you have to do, you can help participate. So you're going to see all of these folks that we're talking about. You're going to hear from every one of those committees. And then we've got the pleasure of hearing from Mr. John Fink. And he's been listening on board with us tonight. And I'm sure he's been reading down through all the chats. And he's also going to be getting copies of all of those uh, questions that either you email us at the spastic conference at gmail.com or down in the chat box, if you will, then we will gather all of that information. And then also, let me remind you, you know, we have an entire platform of different social media. So whatever it is that you like to do on social media, the purpose of our social media pages is to help share awareness of the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. So please feel free to like and share our information that we're putting out on social media, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. I've even created us a Pinterest page for those people that like those different platforms. There's just lots of information that we want to share and connect with other people in the world that have uh, HSP and PLS. And then we want you to be able to share that information with your family and friends, but we've got to grow that awareness globally so that everybody can work together for what we need to uh, in order to bring awareness to these diseases, the scientists. We need more scientists that can be studying these diseases. So anyway, I wanted to share all that with you. I wanted to say good night to you and to thank you again for all of your support. And please feel free. I think there is um, some information that we are going to be looking at uh, as far as a poll, which is like a survey. And what we want you to do is to answer that survey, if you will, and let us know how much you appreciated tonight's uh, spastic conference. And if you um, say something negative on there, we probably will reconsider doing this in the future. But no, nah, we're probably going to still do it. But I just wanted to let you know that we love all of you. We appreciate all of you. And if you have any questions, to send them our way. And we will do our very best to get those answered. And that's all I have tonight. So unless there's anybody else that is able to jump on and have any communications with me as I'm saying goodbye, then uh, please uh, jump on and say good night. And we'll see you guys tomorrow at 11 o'clock. So please try to get on maybe a couple of minutes too. And if it seems like we're having technical problems, just forgive us and we'll do better next time. So thank you so much everyone and have a great evening. And thank you again for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye.